500 years after Martin Luther launched what became the Protestant Reformation, his actions still exert a profound effect. And that includes a major impact on modern-day American political debates. How so? Our next guest addressed that question during a recent presentation for the John Locke Foundation. He is Dr. Michael Gillespie, professor of political science and philosophy at Duke University. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here. So first of all, before we get into how this has impacted things in America, in American uh, uh, political and philosophical debates, uh, remind us just how significant a, a, an impact this event had. Martin Luther supposedly nailing the 95 theses on the door in Wittenberg. Well, we know now that he probably didn't nail, nail them on the door, but, but it is fascinating because uh, within three weeks of his having published the 95 theses, they were known all the way across Europe. Part of this is just uh, an indication of the new power of the media, which is to say the printing press. Uh, we've seen some of that again today with uh, the rapidity with which news travels from one place to another. But for Europe, this was the first European-wide event that really was occasioned by the publication of these 95 theses, which turned an obscure German monk into a historical figure. And after he uh, published these theses and uh, got all the attention and we ended up seeing the Reformation, one of the things that you talk about in your presentation is the way that different strains of this thought moved around to various countries and ended up coming to impact America in more than one way. Well, yes, and we think of, uh, you know, we think of our own differences between secularism and evangelicalism, for example, and uh, we imagine that uh, they come from two different uh, sources when in fact uh, you can trace them all back to Luther's uh, 95 theses in a, in a kind of strange way. And partly that is the distinction between what we sometimes call the magisterial reformation and the radical reformation. Uh, the magisterial reformation, which includes Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli, um, went off in one direction that really uh, imagined an omnipotent God who could do anything but diminish the capacity for human freedom being able to uh, affect one's theological fate. Uh, the Radical Reformation, by contrast, really wanted to emphasize human freedom and uh, the role that human beings could play in determining uh, their own lives. Uh, over time, uh, as you trace out the various paths of these things, we're, we're prone to think that the Magisterial Reformation was, was central and important for us because it does uh, help to explain religion that we see around us today. Uh, but in fact, without understanding the Radical Reformation, and particularly the, the role that freedom played uh, within the Radical Reformation, it's hard to understand what happened to Protestantism. So Protestantism today, uh, for the most part, even among evangelicals, is imagined to be a religion in which people have a choice about whether to stand with Christ or not. Uh, the magisterial reformers, Calvin and Luther, certainly didn't believe that. Um, that had a lot to do with uh, intervening history, uh, particularly Jacobus Arminius, the Wesleys, the origins of Methodism, baptism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, uh, um, within the Radical Reformation, there were, uh, there were strong concerns about the uh, role that Christ actually played in the Godhead. And as a result, the relationship between man and God, and between, particularly between man and Christ, should Christ be seen as a transcendent God or should Christ be seen as preeminently a moral model on which we should uh, model our behavior? Within the Radical Reformation, and particularly among the anti-Trinitarians, the Quakers and others, the notion of inner light, the role of reason played a huge role. And we know now that John Locke, uh, after whom the foundation is named, was uh, in fact probably a Socinian, an anti-Trinitarian who uh, believed that uh, reason and reason's God alone was sufficient for us to lead our moral and religious lives. And uh, insofar as he became the founder of what we think of as classical liberalism and one of the preeminent forms of, uh, one of the preeminent forms of secular life, uh, we see that transferred into America through uh, a number of his writings, but also through the continuation of um, uh, tr anti-Trinitarians coming to the United States, then called Unitarians, 
and uh, particularly uh, jo Joseph Priestley, the very famous scientist, came, was friends with, uh, with Jefferson, with Franklin, and with Washington, and, and during that period of the American founding had a profound impact upon their thinking about religion and, and politics. Uh, in the 1820s, with the Second Great Awakening, we saw a counterpunch to that from Calvinism. And, uh, you know, that has, in a way, shaped the American landscape ever since, a secular view of religion and life and a, um, uh, a more Calvinist uh, view of evangelicalism. What's so interesting to me is that both of them, in a certain sense, derive from Luther, right, and have shaped uh, the way in which we think about the world for better and for worse. And uh, that this religious conflict remains essential to uh, everything we think about in American life. That is the voice of Dr. Michael Gillespie, professor of political science and philosophy at Duke University. Some people may be listening and some of the names are familiar or not, but uh, among our listeners who would not consider themselves particularly religious or, or even spiritual, if they say, oh, all this religious stuff, it doesn't really matter to me, it doesn't have much of an impact on my life, how much of this really does impact the things that people are dealing with day in and day out in terms of the politics and philosophy? Well, I think the, uh, at the core, and, and there are a number of people that have, uh, have attacked religion as, as the source of everything that goes wrong in human life, uh, they consider themselves secular, anti-religious. In point of fact, almost all of them believe in uh, some version of um, some version of the Christian message, even if they don't believe in Christ. And one of the examples I like to use on that is the whole idea of rights. You know, we imagine that rights are something intrinsic to human beings. It's written in our Const uh, Declaration of Independence. It's assumed by the Constitution. The Bill of Rights specifies the rights that we have. Um, but we imagine that it has a foundation beyond merely uh, our own making, uh, rooted either in nature or nature's God, as Jefferson put it. Um, in point of fact, uh, almost all of modern science uh, denies the existence of uh, individual human rights, right? What matters if you believe in modern biology is not, um, is not the individual, but species. And what I try to show, and, and what I tried to show in my previous book, The Theological Origins of Modernity, and in the current book I'm working on, which is gonna be called The Theological Fate of Modernity, is that, um, that things like rights are really a, a, a holdover from Christianity and that they're deeply embedded in our psyche in ways that we don't understand and that are essentially Christian. Now, Muslims understand this because when you, when you, when you tell them that they ought to you know, honor human rights, they see that as a Western imposition because they recognize that it's a, a Christian notion and not something compatible with their religion.